We good? There we go. <laughs> I would turn this mic off. I think it's this one that's doing that. There we go. There we go. How we doing? Good. Good to see everybody. We're doing well. Um, many of you have asked, and I just want to start by saying thank you to those of you who prayed um, for my family and for my specifically my brother and his family this past weekend, um, and for me, um, some of you knew what was going on before Sunday, some of you didn't, um, so just thank you so much for your prayers, for uh, flooding me with love and my family with love, and um, so Drew and his family were, were coming back from vacation, of course, uh, on the way back from Florida, and they were right outside Louisville, Kentucky, and Drew came up on a car that, would sl- that had slowed down because of an accident, and so Drew came up in that car and slowed down, and the truck behind him was on his phone, hit him going 75, and uh, spun them into the car in front of them, and so, uh, yeah, it was bad. Everybody was hurt in some way, some to varying degrees, some more serious than others, um, they're home now. Uh, they were obviously uh, very traumatized. It was very difficult. My, my little nephew, Ezra, the six-year-old, um, has a jagged scar going all the way across his head. He'll have it for the rest of his life. He had 30-something stitches up here. and um, uh, he's, uh, that, was, that was really tough. Um, Drew's got a... a he had dislocated shoulder, some torn muscles up here, and a, a, a fracture in his lower back. Um, they're all home. They're just going to recover for the next week, and uh, he is going to take the week off. His his work is he, he's a police officer, is being very understanding, of course, and then he'll settle back into light duty. In other words, he'll have someone in the car. He won't have to do anything overly physical. Um, Ezra was supposed to go back to school. He won't do that. He can't have any head impact for a month. And he's six years old. He's got a four-year-old brother, and they love to wrestle. So be praying about that. Um, uh, Gideon, the little baby, is he's doing great. They were concerned about some brain uh, bruising and some blood spots that looks like they've checked him out. He's okay. Um, and be praying for Laura, my brother's uh, mother-in-law. She went down to get some time in Florida and to help with the kids. Um, she was in the back with Ezra, so they got the full impact of the, the vehicle. Um, she has over 30 broken bones. Um, her lower half is, is destroyed, and so she will have many surgeries ahead of her. Um, it's, 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 uh, she's going to be in the hospital a long time, so just be praying for her. Um, uh, just thank you so much for your love and for your prayers. It was definitely scary, you know. Uh, got a text at 1 o'clock on a Friday night from my mom saying, when you get this, please call. It's like, oof, that's not good. So um, just glad everybody's okay, truthfully. It was one of those that um, we're, we're glad everybody's okay. We're glad everybody walked away. And um, the, the church, our church, church is there. People we don't even know of just show them abundant kindness. I mean, church there found out about it, sent them dinner and bought them car seats. And uh, the police station there bought them two car seats and, um, you all have asked, some of you all have asked me for their address so you can send them stuff. I mean, just thank you so much. Uh, but we're praising the Lord that everybody's okay and, and uh, thank you for your prayers. All right, well, I want to give that update. Many of you were asking. I figured it was best just probably say it all at once. So um, thank you for your prayers and your thoughts. And um, of course, Sunday, I'm so thankful for, you know, I told Brandon and I told Kevin, I'm thankful that I could leave with absolute confidence. You know, they did a great job. Brandon did a phenomenal job Sunday, and you all were well fed. And, uh, of course, the meeting and everything went, went well Sunday night. So I'm really thankful for a church that, you know, if I need to just leave and drive to Louisville, things will run perfectly without me. That's the way it's supposed to go, right? Uh, if the church needs one person, we got a problem. So, uh, so thank you for your prayers, and, of course, thank you to those who were involved uh, Sunday and, and, and making all that work. All right, well, we are in Psalm 122 this evening. Uh, pray for our teenagers. They are 
taking over the Olympian ministry tonight. So the teenagers are running the Olympian ministry. We've got teens teaching. We've got teens running games. We've got teens running snack. So as basically it's a success if all the kids come out alive and having a good time, right? So, uh, uh, but they'll do a great job. Uh, I'll be praying for them. I'll be praying for our kids as they hear the word. Well, we continue our series through the Psalms of Ascent. And I want you to think about something that you've always, maybe a place you've always wanted to go, a scene you've always wanted to see. I want you to think in your mind, I don't know what it is for you, something you wanted to see more than anything, a place you wanted to go more than anywhere. Maybe it was, you know, Everyone tells me to go see the Grand Canyon, or maybe, maybe it was the Rockies, or maybe it was, a, maybe it was a different part of the world, or whatever's for you. Maybe it was a theme park that you, you know, there's a movie you love, and you wanted to see that represented, or whatever. And you, and you got there after the travel, and, you, and you're standing there, and you're taking all of it in, and there's this sense of, there's this sense of finality, final joy. I mean, you're finally there. You're finally taking it in. You, you have that heart's desire. And, and then you think about that trip. Um, and let's just say for the sake of you know, our, our illustration here, you, you really wanted to go out west. You really wanted to see you know, the Grand Canyon. You're standing there and you're taking in this phenomenal, overwhelming, visually astounding scene. And then you do the hotel thing and, you know, you have your, your time away, your trip. And, and then finally, you've made the trip home and you open the front door and the smells of home hit you. Because, you know, every home has a smell, right? You know, sometimes it's a mixture of good things. And in my home, it smells like, what does my home smell like? I've had to think about it. My home smells like probably <laughs> my wife's favorite candle and my son's feet. That's probably what it smells like, right? My son has stinky feet, right? Um, so, you know, it smells like kids. I'm sure my house smells like kids. I, I'm, I have no doubt that it does, you know? All the smells of home hit you. And the, 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 the creak in your door that, that's unique to you, that sound that you hear, that brings just this tiny sense of nostalgia. I remember when I used to come home from college, walking up my parents' house in Ohio, I would smell the coffee maker. And the way that my dad used to make coffee uh, with that coffee maker, especially in contrast to college coffee, you know, where I didn't have the money to pay for the college coffee shop, it was, you know, the drip stuff. It's just that smell as you walk up, it feels like home, it, it tastes like home, it, it fills you with all of those senses of joy and nostalgia and sentiment. Well, in our text tonight, the psalmist has made the long journey. These pilgrims have made the long journey. They've gone through the tents of those who are camping out in their pilgrimage. They've traveled with their friends from far lands, Gentile countries. That's Psalm 120. They've, they've acknowledged where their help comes from in the day and in the night. That's Psalm 121. And they walk through the gates of Jerusalem and finally they take in the scene. And the smells and the sentiment and the joy of home hits them. And they just pause for a moment and they take it all in. Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, and was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There are thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek 
your good. So as you noticed in verse 21, 22, verse 1, you realize the way that, you realize why I started the way that I did. Verse 2, they're, they're there, they're in the house of the Lord, they're, or they're about to enter the house of the Lord, they've just walked through the gates, they're standing in Jerusalem, they're finally there. And what we will see in this psalm is that even though that clear sentiment of home, that that, that sense that you finally arrived, even if you were to come back from something you love so dearly, it's still the simplicity of home that draws you back. Is that as I said even recently, especially, I think I said it last week. I say it often, I'm sure, but it's not the smells, it's not the sentiment, it's not the creaky door, it's not the smell of the coffee primarily that makes home for me what it is. It is the faces and the personalities and the people. And that's hopefully true of you. Unfortunately, not all people would say that about their home life. But what we'll see in this psalm is that when we consider home that God intends, it is not to be understood as separate from the people, but is to be understood as primarily located in the people. That home is not a location of geography, but a location of person, of community. Let's pray, and we'll begin to work through that concept in this psalm together. Father, we thank you for your people. We thank you that you have intended for your people a place. And we have a future but we bear home with us, we bear home in us. We are for and with one another. Home for and with one another. Or we are at least to bear marks of that home, that future that you have preserved for us. I ask that you'd give us great grace now to understand your word, that your spirit would do his work and helping us understand and that we would be challenged and changed and transformed for your glory through this text. And we ask through Christ, amen. Note with me in verses one and two, the joyous, the joyous destination. The joyous destination. Again, just to set the context a little bit, remember these psalms of ascent are, these are the songs that are sung as they're going home, as they're, or as they're going back to Jerusalem, as they're walking, working their way back up as as maybe those who've been exiled, or those who live outside the land, or those who've gone back to the, their home country, dis- separate and, and, and distant from Israel, where, where we understand that in Jerusalem is, is, does God meet primarily, the city is understood as the place of God's connection with the people of Israel, the place of God's primary meeting with them his primary working with them, the concept of kingdom, the concept of king, the concept of security, of peace, primarily understood within the context of Jerusalem. That's what these people thought. This was the epicenter of their Jewishness and all of the things that they received from that Jewishness. Peace, promise, prosperity from Yahweh. And so they're finally working their way back because not only does Jerusalem represent peace and prosperity from Yahweh, but it represents where truly God meets with his people in the temple. This is the climax of their time, their worship, that they're going to meet with God in the temple in Jerusalem. And so they've made the journey there. They've camped out. They've passed through the dangers. They've They've worked through these pilgrimages together. No doubt they're with people. They're traveling with people. They're, they're companions as they work their way home. And they're finally there. They've passed through the gates. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. We've made it. Look where we are now. Breathe it in. Take it in. Look at it. And the psalmist begins, by the way, most people think that this is uh, authored by, by David. It, it certainly sounds like David. 
Um, it is similar to the other Zion Psalms, most of which David wrote, Psalm 46, Psalm 48, Psalm 76, 84, and 87. And so it is very likely that David wrote this and that as they were finally coming up, these, these travelers were finally coming up, the final steps, the final pathway up the steps, up the hill into Jerusalem, they would sing this as they, as they passed through the gate. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so you can, you can see this in your mind's eye that as they're making this journey, the, it's not their ultimate destination. This is, the, this is just the first true joy as they're arriving in Jerusalem, but the ultimate joy, the pinnacle of their joy, the pinnacle of this experience, the pinnacle of their pilgrimage will be when they get to the temple and they offer up worship to Yahweh. And so they were glad when they said, let us go, again, plural. This is a communal aspect. Let us go to the house of the Lord. So they are, they have finally arrived at this joyous destination, this place that means so much to them as a people, this place set up by Yahweh, torn down by its oppressors and rebuilt by Yahweh. So there's this joyous destination. But now what the psalmist is going to do, again, presumably David, likely David, is he's going to point out some of the special significance of Jerusalem. Why is Jerusalem such a big deal? Is it really cracked up all it's cracked up to be? And so he's going to explain, he's going to press into what Jerusalem means to them, why they're so relieved to be there. Yes, it's home, but it, it, it has so many more ramifications than just the concept of the epicenter of Jewishness. And so look with me in verses 3 through 5 at Jerusalem's provisions. What does it provide for the people? What do they receive from this place? Well, they receive security. Verse 3, Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. It has the idea of strength, of protection, of fortification. We've seen this constantly throughout the Psalms, that these cities hewn out of mountains or hewn into mountains, providing protection and security, surrounded by walls to keep enemies out and the people in, to give them the high ground so that they are firmly rooted in safety unthreatened by enemies. So Jerusalem is seen as a place of safety, like home is seen as a place of safety. A second provision that the city itself provides is the very thing that Yahweh himself most deserves, which is the concept of praise. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together, safety and security, to which the tribes go up. The tribes of what? Israel. The tribes of the Lord and was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the Lord. So what does Jerusalem provide? It is the epicenter of worship because this is where God meets with his people in the temple And so not only is it seen as a place of strength and security and of protection, it's the primary center of praise. This is why the people go up. So on their way, as as inevitably the, the children are struggling with their bag and whatever bags mom and dad give them and you know it's not their turn on the donkey they're walking now it's so it's 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 the other siblings turn on the donkey and they tug on mommy and daddy why do we have to do this the answer is simple because it was decreed for Israel to give thanks to praise Yahweh to offer up worship to his name On the basis of what? His his redemptive work. What he's done on Israel's behalf. This is not general praise. It's specific praise. It's praise of thanksgiving. Go to Jerusalem to offer up thanks to the name of the Lord. 
He has delivered the people. And thirdly, Jerusalem provides the assurance of justice. Verse 5, their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Now, this is fascinating. The psalmist, just walk back through, let's, let's review a little bit. The psalmist, I was glad when we all agreed that we should go to the house of the Lord. We're here, breathe in the city. Look at it. Do you know what's so fascinating? Do you know what's so significant? What's so wonderful about our city is that it brings us protection. It's the primary center of praise. And as they enter the city, and as they walk through the city, they can look around at the injustice around them. And they, look, they can look back at their history as a nation, constantly oppressed, constantly in bondage, oppressed by paganism, themselves falling into paganism and experiencing the, the darkest times in their history due to that paganism. They can look at Jerusalem and they can say, on this basis we know the thrones of judgment have been established we can be certain that God will execute justice. Which when you think about it, for Israel, that has to mean so much. Certainly more than it means for us. Because we've never felt oppression like this. We weren't, we've never been in bondage. At least you and I haven't. We've never felt the distance, not only from home or family, but the spiritual distance that they were subjected to by the, by the pagan kings that oppressed them, that enslaved them. That for generations and generations, as their children asked them, why are we still in bondage, their only answer is that one day God will make it right. God will make it right. God will make it right. And some of the generations of Israel got allowed to experience that justice. But not all of them. So Jerusalem provides the assurance of justice. The thrones of judgment were set up. And though you and I do not feel the specific difficulty or the specific circumstance of oppression like this, we certainly, though we we don't have to necessarily, again, you and I, look back at injustice in our own history. When I say our, in our own, I mean our, the church. I'm not talking about American history. I'm talking about our church or even the American church at large. We certainly can look around us and we feel the effects of that injustice. We certainly can look around us and we have questions as to why so-and-so is allowed to suffer and why this church is experiencing this. Why an entire nation of believers, the church in the Middle East is being oppressed, the church in Asia has experienced persecution, who's going to make that right? And we have the same assurance. The thrones of judgment were set up. And while it does not move us to heartless indifference, while it moves us, it should move us to compassion, it also assures us of who Our God is that he will not allow wrongs to go unrighted. He will not allow darkness to prevail. Thrones of judgment were set. And then the psalmist is moved from this sentimental joy, this arrival, exaltation, to this meditative 
explanation of Jerusalem's significant security or protection, praise, and justice. And he's moved to prayer for Jerusalem. And so note with me the jubilant benediction. You understand that a benediction is a prayer on the behalf of something or someone else. A doxology is a, a description of, an, an ascription, excuse me, an ascription of praise to God. A benediction is a statement of prayer on the behalf of someone. It's an intercession. And so the psalmist prays for Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. He's just prayed, or he's just acknowledged that Jerusalem brings security, but what is the covenantal requirement? May they be secure who love you. God, you may know, excuse me, you may know the protection of God primarily and most assuredly when you are faithful to him. Peace be within your walls. Shalom. So he's praying for peace in verse 6. He's praying for peace in verse 7. Shalom. Pray for the shalom of Israel. Shalom be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say shalom be within you. Who is he praying on the behalf of? For my brothers and companions, the people. This is a community concept. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. The psalmist begins with a communal orientation. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. He prays for the peace of Jerusalem for his, verse 8, companions and family's sake. It's oriented to community. And for the sake of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. It's oriented to community. So all of these ideas of security, of praise, and of the assurance of justice oriented in Jerusalem, the psalmist, probably David, wants to be very specific that we understand this is on the behalf of the people for the praise of God. It's for the people by the people, for the praise of God. And so it's, I mean, it's, it's almost like, I remember that just to, again, put, try to put it in human kind of pilgrimage travel terms. I remember last, maybe it was two years ago, I don't, whenever my family went, whenever we went to Myrtle Beach for vacation, we, we got there and and, and you remember this, you know, you do this as maybe family vacation, you, you, know, you get there and you get everything out of the car and you open the room to the hotel, the resort you're staying at, and there's just like this, this elation, you know, it's like we're here, it's like the kids kind of lose their minds for a second, everyone just gets excited and you're checking the place out and that moment, is, it's, it's like on a, on a communal family level, they show up and they're like, we're here, isn't this fantastic? Now, let's not forget why we're here. Let's go to the house of the Lord. And this is something that we do together. I mean, this, is, this is not isolationist or individualistic. This is on the behalf of the people for the glory of God with the people. And we go together. And you should see in your mind's eye the picture that the psalmist is, is referencing. These droves of people coming back for whatever the feast was. Maybe it was Passover, maybe it's the Feast of Booths, Feast of Lights, we don't know. Droves and droves and these parties of rejoicing right at the gates. And then the excitement building up to when all the people can finally go to the house of the Lord together. And when they do, the thanksgiving that takes place. And this is their appreciation for Yahweh to remember the history of redemption to remember his marvelous redemptive works and freeing them from Egypt and from Persia and from Babylon. But you and I, by God's great grace, see this now, this incredible journey, this incredible pilgrimage on the other side of the cross you and I see this journey 
and all these tents strewn from the foreign lands outside Israel to in Israel to all the way to Jerusalem as they make these pilgrimages, as they make this journey, you and I see this concept on the other side of the new covenant. And there's no reason for villages of tents making their way back to the epicenter of worship. Because John 1.14 says that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And He came to us. And now through the Spirit, through the Spirit, this community aspect of worshiping Worshiping God finds its location, its home in us. So that I need go nowhere specific to find God in worship because he is always with me and in me through the person and work of Christ. And so the joy that Israel experienced to go to the house of the Lord, you have that constant communion with him through what he has done in sending his son to dwell among us, to make the journey to us so that we may journey to our eternal home with him. I think there's two applications to consider in this passage. And the first one, there are ecclesiological applications or just church applications. That word ecclesiological, you've heard me say it, is from the Greek word ekklesia, which is the idea of assembly or the church. And in it, in this passage, we see the communal nature of the people of God going to the house of God together and experiencing that climax in worship And you and I understand that now through the new covenant, we have this unique privilege, a day set aside, the Lord's day, and we should feel this renewed joy and excitement every Lord's day when we have the privilege to go to the house of the Lord together. And, and they had to walk a lot farther and they had to give up a lot more and it was a lot harder for them and so the joy was proportionately more. And I just wonder for the people of God today how much more we might treasure and cherish and find home in the house of the Lord if it weren't so easy for us. If truly it cost something, it meant something. I mean, I've lived in parts of the country where if you drive longer than 20 minutes, you just find a different church. I mean, that's 20 minutes is long by some standards. It's the South because there's a church on every block, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've been to some churches. I've, I've, heard, I've heard some people say they switch churches or they, com- they constantly griped about the church because it was too hot in the auditorium. Uh, they couldn't get the thermostat figured out. And we've heard that one. We've seen that one. The decor bothering, whatever. I just wonder if we adopted, because we, we know so much more than these people were given the right to understand, the blessing to understand. And their commitment was so much deeper. Sure, there was the temptation to do it out of routine or tradition or whatever, but that's, that's, that's not the spirit of this psalm. There's actual delight here. They were excited to be with the people of God in the house of God. And may God give us such a view of him that there is true delight in us as the people of God go to the house of God, recognizing that home 
is in us. We have the opportunity to minister a taste, just a foretaste, of our forever home in this world. Because it is not the sentiment, it is not the smells, it is not the nostalgia that makes our eternal home what it is. It is who God is, what he's done in Christ, he's given us rights in the Holy Spirit, And what we observe and feel and enjoy in the people of God. We bear marks of our eternal home in our congregation. You might just be the smell of heaven to the person next to you in the pew. A taste of the new heaven and new earth. This is what God has intended in his church. Spiritual home is not geographical. It is a place of community. And it is located in the hearts of his people. This is why the New Testament church is so different than anything the world has to offer. It's why it looks different. It's why it feels different. There's nothing like it. So there are church ramifications to this. There's church applications to this, but there's also eschatological or future ramifications to this. It reminds us truly of the joy of a future city. Yes, I just went through this whole thing about how the joy of heaven is in the people. The joy of home is a better way to say it because heaven is not our eternal home that the new heaven and new earth is. But the, the, the eternal home is in the people. That taste of, of the eternal home is in the church. It's in you and it's in me. But, but imagine with me the satisfaction and security and joy And delight and fulfillment of these people finally crossing the threshold of Jerusalem where they've wanted all along. They've sweat for this journey. They've bled for this journey. And now they're home. And imagine with me the spiritual thirst that this gives us as all of life around us disappoints as the effects of the curse press in on us, as the effects of the curse tempt us from the inside, as family fails, as finances fail, as the insecurity of of the stock market and the economy and politics and all of these things crumble, as we walk through times of joy in life and then that loved one is taken from this world, Imagine what it will be like with me when you and I take in with our eyes the home and city that we have always wanted. And the new heaven and the new earth is not concept, it is reality. And faith is sight and we stand and we take it in and it overwhelms us. And every good thing that God has provided as grace in this life, either circumstantial or relational, is in its fullest effect and on its fullest display in that country. For he's prepared for them a city where God is not ashamed to be called their God. Augustine says of this passage, we sigh in this pilgrimage, but we shall rejoice in that city. So as we pray for the peace of the body of believers, the church of whom the New Testament refers to in Galatians 4 verse 26 as this Jerusalem and which anticipates the future and new Jerusalem, the place of God 
where humans dwell with him after this world and smell fully the scents and savors of home in the people of God and see fully the person of Christ on display in our brothers and sisters, we will know every failing of this world has passed away and every disappointment will be gone and everything good that God has put in our hearts to want will finally be met. The psalm teaches us that our clearest picture of home and the greatest protection as we travel there is the people with which we journey. We don't travel the road alone, nor will we arrive there alone. This is a journey of community, and we taste the joys of this life together We endure the disappointments of this life together, and so we will enjoy the beauties of that eternity forever. And so let us live out this peace in our life as a congregation, the life of our body. Let us pray for the peace of our congregation. Let us pray for the peace of the world as it needs reconciled, as believers need reconciled to God. And let us pray for endurance and patience until we finally breathe in the joys of our eternal home. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this psalm. We thank you that it reminds us of what is ahead because there are so many things in this life that, are, that tempt us to latch on so hard to what is here, right now, right in front of us and grasp to what will ultimately pass away. It's smoke. We can't hold on to smoke. It'll go away with this world. We can't live for the fleeting, but we so often do. So thank you for these passages that cause us to look back in thanksgiving and look forward in hope. And as we look forward in hope, it changes how we live now. It causes us to be intentional. It causes us to pray more. It causes us to live joyfully for the next life and to seek fruit and rewards in that one, treasures for that one, not trinkets here. And I ask these things and pray them through Christ. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask you what we always ask. We've got, we've got more time this evening. So I'm going to ask you to think about how the psalm helps us pray. How does the psalm help us pray? As you think about that real quick, I'm going to grab some water. <clears throat> do this every week you'd think I would just grab the water to begin with how does the psalm help us pray yeah be thankful for others amen amen yes brother mm Yeah. Yep. Amen. Cause us to compare what what's in this life and what awaits us and yeah, it causes Thanksgiving. Amen. How's the psalm help us pray? Yes, brother. I know, easy for you to say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And again, I don't want to. I, I don't want to. This is not about us, you know. But like. Just to use our own family this past weekend as an 
illustration for this. I mean, like, uh, not just this church. Again, random churches just providing stuff, like hearing about our needs and my, fa- my brother's needs and his family's needs and just this is what the family of God does. This is what the church of God does. It's this invisible, unstoppable force that just cares for each other. People will never meet. Names will never know. And food starts showing up. And that's just what, I mean, that's the church of God. And we, ex- we, have, a, we have a microcosm of that here as a local body. And we help each other journey. I mean, this is a hard pilgrimage. And it's really hard for some. And it's hard on everybody, but it's really hard for some. And we go through it together. Amen. Somebody else. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I quoted Augustine tonight, but another thing that he says in, uh, in this passage is he applies the word shalom. Shalom to my people. And he's a pastor, you know. Shalom to my people. He's referring to his little congregation. Peace to my people. This is what we need. We need the peace of God in our hearts. Amen. Anybody else? Uh, I would just add one more. It causes us to live intentionally. I mean, if we know we live for the future, that we're supposed to be storing up treasures in heaven, teach us to number our, our days. I mean, we, I, I, I want to make a difference there. And what I do here makes a difference there. And so the future causes us to live much differently in the now, storing up treasures in heaven. All right, well, let us head to our time of prayer now. Um, I do have this reminder. Uh, please help in the gym after our time tonight. We're going to be setting up um, a meal for the, the Willis funeral, which is taking place tomorrow. Um, be praying about all of that. Be praying for the family. So if you are willing and able to help set up for the meal, we would certainly take it, all right? Okay. Linda says, meet you in the kitchen. Okay, so that's, I know set up is a little tricky tonight. So that would, yeah, find Linda in the kitchen. All right. Um, well, going through a prayer sheet. Um, again, thank you for your prayers. Um, already caught you up on all of that. Um, Again, keep praying for uh, the Willis service and those involved for the whole family. Um, be praying for uh, everything to come together there. Um, pray for Pras- Pastor Brandon, number three there, Alyssa and Eden. Uh, Alyssa leaves for a mission slash work trip to Kenya. Uh, she left today. So um, she will be gone n- until next Wednesday. Uh, so be praying for Pastor Brandon. I know his family, his parents got here today. Be praying for Eden. Uh, and <laughs> just kidding. She's a grandma and grandpa. She'll be fine. Uh, but <laughs> no, they'll be great. So be praying for them. Uh, and I know they will appreciate that. Be praying for Tammy Birch, Dirt Birch's grandson, Azariah. Again, if you don't know them, they sit over here almost every Sunday. Uh, he's a sweet little guy. Be praying for him. Um, be praying for Shirley. Um, ongoing health concerns pray for, for the lord to encourage her heart that the grace of the lord to think of what finally what uh, paul says to philemon the grace of the lord would be with her spirit P- uh, please pray for joe davidson uh i was i was over there yesterday to talk to joe um we had a we had a sweet time he's been diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis um and so be praying for be praying for him and be praying for Scott as Scott cares for him. Scott is, is his primary caretaker, so be praying for him. Uh, be praying for Annie. She has an operation coming up on September 1st. Be praying for her, for her peace for her, and for that surgery. Uh, we're praising the Lord that Roberta's feeling better. 
continue to pray for Elsie as she is recovering. Um, here's what we're really here's what we're really praying for. Okay, we're really praying that Elsie is up to coming to our 75th anniversary here in a few months. She is our only living charter Grace Bible Church member. Okay, so she one of the one of the signers. Okay, so we really want to have her here. That would be awesome if we could have her here. Okay, so be praying for her. Um, we don't want to push her, but we also kind of do. You know what I mean? It's one of those, right? We really want to have her here. And uh, Elsie's the best. I don't know if you've had conversations with Elsie, but uh, Elsie's just awesome. I mean, she's just awesome. Praying for her. Um, and she, sometimes she watches online. So, so you heard that, Elsie, if you're watching online. All right. Uh, be praying for Ken and Judy. Keep praying for Ron. Uh, that they would figure out what's going on with sinus issues. Keep praying for those caring for their parents, Dennis and Billy, and, of course, many others. Um, Linda Lichty has mentioned several prayer requests as well. That's number 13 there. Um, and I would encourage you to keep praying for our missionaries as we work towards a time of giving for them. I'll be praying for them and their ministry. Of course, you can see some specific needs for